Hello and welcome into the Fog.net podcast. My name is Michael Swain, the Kansas beat writer for 24-7 Sports. It is a Saturday and there's football to talk about and Kevin Flaherty joins me. We're going to talk about the Kansas football spring showcase, which was on Friday night held at Rock Chalk Park. Obviously, you can't hold that at David Booth Kansas Memorial Stadium. Um, if they did, it'd be a health risk for everybody involved. So they moved it to Rock Chalk Park, um, which is actually where the coaches' offices have been for the last couple months as spring football unfolds. Um, Kevin, I mean, let's dive right into this. I thought atmosphere-wise, like I think we can start there because it's a different setting than I think a normal spring game. And then we can talk about the actual football that we saw from there. But atmosphere-wise, Kevin, I thought it was really, really fun. It, it wasn't the like a, a totally packed crowd where maybe I think some K, KU people were hoping, but I thought it was a really fun atmosphere just around the game. It sounded like people were having fun. I know you were up in the stands. Yeah. What was your experience like? Yeah, I thought it was a blast. I, I honestly thought it was maybe a little bit of a preview for what we can expect when Kansas plays at sporting. Um, oh, yeah. it, obviously, the crowds will be better then, but in terms of being more of an intimate setting, right? You know, you're not up in the nosebleeds where you you can't see what's going on you know you're you're a lot more connected to to what's going on and and i thought they did a great job with all the surrounding stuff from you know the concessions to the food trucks that they had there to the games that the the kids could play and everything they did a really nice job of making it really fan friendly And, and you and i were talking just before we went on air you know i went out to the kansas city royals practice uh before their season started and they weren't even saying over the announce, you know, over the announcements and stuff, over the PA, I guess, uh, who is in the batting cage. So you're watching somebody and somebody would hit just an absolute, you know, rake over the over the wall. And you're like, who hit that? And you couldn't always tell. And they did a really nice job of identifying, you know, people as well. You know, they went ahead and called it like it was a game saying, hey, Harry Stewart's on the carry. The tackle was made by you know, Dylan Wudke or, or whatever. And, and mm-hmm. so I, I thought it was, it was really fan friendly. It was something that was easy to watch. Obviously, aside from the scrimmage where there's only one thing going on, you know, at a time, it's kind of tough to track all the different groups and, and seeing all the different guys. But what did you think from down on the sidelines? Yeah. I thought it was really cool. And look, I went into this expecting a whole lot less of the 11 on 11 stuff because yeah. I think it was last year's spring showcase where maybe it was 20 minutes of the 11 on 11. And a lot of it was just individual drills and, and stuff that I think if you're a fan attending a spring game, it's not what you want to watch. Like you don't want to watch the defensive backs, you know, back pedal, back pedal, then break on a ball. Like that's yeah, not sure. super riveting to watch. And I thought, it was really awesome that it was an hour, probably maybe even a little bit more of 11 on 11. And, yeah. you know, during the uh, individual parts, you know, I kind of went over to the offensive line and defensive line. Cause I think that's probably one of the more interesting things right now is, is the trenches yeah. for KU and, and who's looking good. And, um, and look, I think at the end of the day, you know, what Kansas has at wide receiver and running back yeah. and, you know, watching them go against the defense, it's a lot, it's seven on seven. Like it's not a huge deal, but I thought, yeah, it, you know, KU practice is so fast. And I think for people that maybe haven't been to a practice before or haven't been to a spring showcase, if that was your first one, you probably get a taste of, of how quick things move. It's a lot of, you're going from drill to drill, not a lot of standing around and waiting. And so I think overall it creates a fun product for people to watch. And it definitely seems like, you know, people were engaged and I thought people stayed for a very long time. Yeah. Um, and I just thought overall, you know, and look, they probably needed to announce all that stuff because there was so much mixing and matching that was going sure. on. Like, you know, one drive, it's like the ones at the skill positions and like the, the number two offensive line, like K did a lot of mixing and matching to, to give different guys, different situational looks and, I thought that was pretty cool too, that you, it wasn't super like, okay, well now it's the ones and then the ones don't go back in again. You know, it was pretty much, you know, kind of mixing and match and different guys going to different points. So I thought overall really fun. I think huge credit to everyone that put that on. Cause obviously it is a different setting, right? This isn't David Booth, Kansas Memorial Stadium where they know how to put on an event there. This is different. And here's a side story. So the new women's soccer coach was there um, and he came over and talked to us for a few minutes. And, you know, one of the first things he says is, well, Oh, well, the turf looks good. 
you know, it's not super torn up. And you think about this, right? They are borrowing the facility of sure. the women's soccer team right now. And they've practiced. I think that was the second time they practiced there. And yeah, of course he's worried about the turf. Like who wouldn't be? And so I think it's just another very, you know, point that, Hey, this is something that is unique. And I think the fact that it did go off seamless from my perspective, at least it seems like, you know, that's a huge positive. Yeah. And for those who haven't been out by Memorial stadium recently, there is no more David Booth, Kansas Memorial stadium right now. You know, the, uh, the, um, the East stands, I guess are still standing, Mm -hmm. but, uh, the bowl, the West stands, all of that, you know, and and that's something that, that maybe I didn't entirely understand, you know, reading the stuff you, you read about how they were going to renovate it and they knocked all of that out. I mean, it, it is no longer there. And it's funny. Uh, we went by, uh, the new alumni building that's, Mm. you know, was just put up in like the last year or so. And you had pictures of what Memorial Stadium looked like when they first built it. And it was just one set of stands on one side. And that's what it looks like right now. And, and so it, it's kind of it, it's kind of funny. Um, they are so deep in that construction process already. And, and you know, it, it's it looks like it, it's coming along, you know, pretty well, at least in, in terms of the demolition stuff. It'll be interesting once we actually start to see structures go up. Yeah. And it's already starting. It's already starting. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's the fun part about spring is I've, I've been in Lawrence and, and by the football stadium, like basketball season, I'm on the other side of campus. Like it's just sure. different. And now being at practice every day, every three days, you know, you get to see it progress over the last month. And it's crazy how much actual like building is now going on where yeah. for a while there, right, I was taking it down then setting the foundation and some of the piping and all that. And so it's crazy. Like it's not even at peak like efficiency yet. I think there's in the, I think at the max efficiency, it's going to have a 500 people there. Once you talk about plumbing, electricity, the actual steel workers, like for the last couple of months, it's been, you know, kind of, I think in the 100 to 200 range of people. And so the thing's about to start hitting, you know, hyperdrive. And so I think that's really cool too, but all right, let's get to the football, Kevin. Yep. Um, Look, I think first and foremost, Jalen Daniels is is a big topic, and I think he yeah. will continue to be a big topic until Kansas kicks off against Lindenwood, and then it will continue to be a topic every single week until he plays all 12 games of a regular season. Um, you know, Jalen has not done a bunch this spring, and it's been a progression where, again, I'm at practice every day. You see different drills, and it's the same drills every day. So you can actually track progression where early in spring, the times when they did quarterback drills where Jalen would have to like twist and throw and torque, he sat those out. And then the final couple of practices, he started doing those. And then I saw him running full speed in some drills as well. And so to see him get that 11 on 11 action, um, I thought was really great to see. And it's a big positive. And look, Lance Leipold said that a part of the reason they did that was to make sure everyone saw Jalen Daniels out there. He can do it. <laughs> He's still alive. He's healthy. He's with the Kansas team. And so I think then you also get kind of this throw here that I think is probably set Twitter alight. Um, and, and thanks to Katie Marr from uh, WIBW for letting me use this video. But yeah, um, Kevin, just getting to watch Jalen then. What'd you think in between seven on seven, the 11 on 11, just watching him? What was kind of your, your takeaways? What'd you see? Yeah, it was funny because he was in full pads and he was stretching and everything. And so that was kind of an an update in itself, you know, like, hey, he's he's out here. He's not, you know, he's not in gym shorts or whatever. Mm -hmm. And and the quarterbacks were all throwing and he wasn't out there with the quarterbacks at first. And he started to come out and Jim Zabrowski kind of pulled him aside. And so you didn't want you didn't know, like okay, are they going to let him throw, you know? And then, you know, he did start throwing. They He went out, you know, he stretched with the team. He threw in drills. And then, mm-hmm. you know, getting a, a couple snaps of, of 11 on 11 work, you know, it was it was encouraging to see. And, and the things that you mentioned, you look for the way that he moves, you know, and the way he was able to generate torque, you know, he looked like Jalen kind of dancing around a little bit. You know, Jalen has a lot of a lot of personality, you know, when he's out there on the field. And so seeing all of those things was great. And of course he connects on the, on the long ball to Quentin Skinner, you know, they pull him out pretty soon afterwards. Like, okay, everybody saw what they needed to see. Don't need to put anything else at risk. You know, let's, let's pull him out. But it was really good to see him moving around the way that he was moving around 
throwing the ball, you know, apparently with no discomfort. At least that was what it looked like. Um, we, we've talked so much on this podcast about back injuries and the way that um, the way that they can kind of pop up, the way that they can limit what you're able to do. And so yeah. to be able to see him at least looking like, hey, if Kansas had to play Kansas State tomorrow, you know, Jalen at least looked like he could he could go out and play, you know, was an encouraging thing for sure. Yeah, exactly. And so I thought, you know, you saw the zip on the ball and I think yep. you can see the strength progression probably compared to someone like Isaiah Marshall, who you can probably talk about next. You just see the development that happens right over time, four years. And I was looking at it today, right? It's a, it's a big difference. And I think over time you'll see Isaiah Marshall's arm strength really improve. But yeah. I thought Isaiah showed everything about why people are so excited about him. Yeah. The athleticism, um, even if the arm power isn't at Jalen's level, he still has the ability to make those throws. And I think you still see some of that poise, um, even if things are moving probably a little too fast for him, maybe a notch or two too fast. It's still something where, you see those flashes and that's all you can ask for. So, I mean, Kevin, I thought it was pretty good to see Isaiah out there looking like that. And I think KU, right. You don't want to see Isaiah Marshall playing this fall, but I still think it's a positive spring for him and that he got the time on task. He got to get what the KU coaches call bonus time and spend this time around the coaches and work and get to feel for practice. And I think that's all just such a huge bonus for him going into his freshman year. Yeah, and I, I'm a really big David McComb fan as well. I, I think that he's a guy that looks like he should be a low four-star type guy to me as a quarterback. And the only reason I mention that is because between McComb and Isaiah Marshall, I think the future of the Kansas quarterback position is, is really bright. And you look at where Isaiah is right now and go back and look at where Jalen Daniels was when he was kind of thrown into the fire as a true freshman – and I think it, it's apparent that Isaiah is ahead of where Jalen was a, at the same point from, you know, a reading defenses standpoint. I think he's ahead of where Jalen was. You know, Jalen always had that just absolute howitzer uh, of an arm. And even when he didn't know where it was going all the time, you know, you could see that Isaiah's arm was, was pretty good. But like you said, it's the sort of thing that years in the weight room, you know, with, with Gildersleeve is going to be really good for him increasing that core strength. It was a little uh, a little sad because there were a couple times he broke the pocket for what looked like, hey, this is going to be a really big run. And they blew the whistle the second, yeah. you know, the second mm -hmm. he had the line of scrimmage pretty much. And I get you, you don't want, you know, injuries or, or things like that. And even beyond that, with a freshman quarterback, you kind of want to encourage him to, to stay in the pocket. We know you can run. That's something that, that you're really talented at, but at the same time, you know, let's, let's focus on, on the other things going through your progressions, making the throws. And, and I thought, I thought he threw the ball. Well, um, there were a few decisions that were freshman decisions. Of course, you know, you're always going to have that, but I thought, I thought you put it really well. You know, he showed the things that you want to see when you have a good young freshman quarterback, he showed the talent, and the different things that touchdown pass to to be to Noah was a thing of beauty. I mean, that thing had to be inch perfect with with Die closing on that, and, and Die had a terrific hit. Yeah. It was kind of one of those one of those things where you say terrific pass, terrific catch, terrific hit. You know, uh, all, all around on on that thing. But he he made a couple really nice throws. The touchdown to Keaton Quebeca was a really nice ball, and you know there were. There were definitely some moments there where you're like, yeah, you know, Kansas has a really good freshman quarterback to develop here. Exactly. Yeah. And I think broadly, I think you saw freshman mistakes from both guys. Sure. You know, Cole Ballard is still going to be a redshirt freshman this fall. Yeah. And I think you still saw some trying to toe the line. Right. And I think this is something that if you talk to people around the program, like Jalen Daniels at times has practices where he throws a lot of interceptions. Sure. And because he's trying to, to find the line, right? Where's the edge? Where can I go? Where can I push? Where can I not? And I think that's probably the line that those two guys are trying to find as freshmen in practice. And look, they're getting a lot of reps. Those are two guys that because Jalen um, didn't do a bunch of 11 on 11 stuff every single practice, they get to benefit from that. And I think that's a positive thing, too, is they get this time to, to figure out where that line is. Because when you're in the middle of a season, 
it's week to week, it's game plan. It's not a lot of, you can kind of fiddle with things. So I think that's really good for both of them that they're able to do that. So yeah, I think quarterback wise, you know, it was interesting to get to watch those guys and you see kind of the different, um, different skill sets. And probably also you, when you watch them compared to Jalen, how far they have to go to reach that level. And it probably puts sure. it in perspective too, right? How special of a player, you know, Jalen Daniels is for Kansas and how, I think probably fortunate Kansas is that they have a quarterback like that when the quarterback is obviously the most important position, I think, in all of sports. So, like, I think overall pretty positive for the quarterbacks during spring ball. And, look, yep. it's going to be about keeping Jalen healthy this fall. Yeah, and I think, you know, if, if there is a situation where where one of them has to come in, I would think that Ballard would be ahead. And, it's, and a big part of the reason why is – you know, a lot of the things that people don't necessarily consider when they're talking about quarterbacks, which is, you know, getting guys lined up right, being able to make checks at the line of scrimmage, things that he was able to get some experience mm -hmm. with, you know, last year when he was able to play, you know, last year when he was able to practice, all of those things. He's going to be ahead of Isaiah Marshall there. What makes it interesting and, and you know, knock on wood that this doesn't happen, if you know, Jalen has some sort of long-term injury or something that happens early in the season where say he's going to be gone for five or six games. That's where I think Kansas has a little bit of a decision to make in terms of, Hey, is this the sort of thing where we say we feel really good about, uh, we feel really good about Cole Ballard and his ability to run the system, or is it the sort of thing where we want to get Isaiah Marshall out there because maybe he has a little bit higher ceiling, you know, as he, as he comes along, it, it'll be a fun discussion yeah. over the off season. Yeah, it will be. And look, I think at the end of the day, the red shirt is important and you don't want to burn a season of college eligibility, especially yeah. when you think about someone as talented as Isaiah in the yeah. long-term future. And look like he is six foot. Yeah. Ish six, six, one ish, you know, not necessarily the six, three. Oh my gosh, this guy is great for three years. He's going to the NFL as a first round pick. Right. And with the way NIL is now, right. If Kansas continue to improve its support for football, you know, yep. there's a chance Isaiah Marshall is around for a long time. And I think preserving a red shirt in that season is big. And look, that is a, that's, that's like an <laughs> August, September, October discussion. So we sure, can sure. move on from that, but let, let's get to some of the other stuff on offense. I think, the big thing that I saw at least is screen passes. Yeah, I think that's going to be good and bad. I'm yep. calling it right now. People are going to get really pissed off this fall when KU calls a screen pass on like third and eight and yep. it doesn't work and they end up punting. Um, but I think that's something that Lance Leipold mentioned when he hired Jeff Grimes, that he liked some of these schematic things that he did with the screen game. And I think that's something that KU really didn't do a bunch of with Andy Cole and Nicky with some of those just wide receiver screens. So I thought that was something to me that stood out watching more of this offense. What'd you think? You probably had a better angle on some of the offensive well, sets at least. Well, and I actually have a question for you as hmm. somebody who is at practice every day. How much option did you see? Because we saw almost no option yesterday. Yeah, I mean, it's different. And, and you figure they aren't going to run a ton of option, but at the same time, I think that's one of the more intriguing things as well. You mentioned the screen passes. Yeah. Um, Jeff Grimes is going to run more jet sweep type stuff mm -hmm. because that's more in his wheelhouse. And the other thing, and we, we've talked about it on here before, is the option game. That's mm -hmm. something that, that Grimes didn't really do. Obviously, Kotal Nicky was a triple option guy. That was... That was something that they were going to find a way to to run some of that. I think, you know, you look at, at what they ran in the bowl game with Zabrowski, you know, there was still that option element. And so I do wonder, one, how much option is there going to be, you know, and two, you know, what does that option look like maybe as opposed to, to what they've run in the past? I still think there will be option. And yeah. – Look, it's open to the public, so people from sure. any surrounding school in the four-hour radius could have come and had a, you know, gone full. Um, what was it? It was a K-State that accused Iowa State of recording their huddle. Like yeah. someone could have gone full of that um, and, and done it. So, look, I think there will be option this year, and I think look, the the loss of Matt Lubick here is actually really important because. You know, yeah. Andy Kordonecki was not a triple option option game guy. Like that was Lubick, what he brought to the offense um, when he was hired as an analyst ahead of the 2022 season. So that loss is important. But I think my understanding is that 
there was like a crash course done with Lubick where he helped KU you out and explained a lot of the schematics. So I think well, that's I think, Co- I think Kotal Mickey came from triple option though, didn't he? But they didn't do it at Buffalo. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So it was one of those things where the addition of Lubick helped them add that. So I still think sure. there will be. I think this offense is still going to look like the as Lance Lapp will call it, right? The Kansas offense and what yeah. we've seen KU do. And I think there's going to have to be a fine line with a starting quarterback with back injury history um, and just an injury history period. How much do you really want to run him? I think that's going to yeah. be a big question that will have to be figured out this fall. And I assume it'll probably be week to week and seeing how he's feeling and the type of game that it is. So I think offensively, like, yeah, I still think there will be option. I think you're right though. Jet sweep screens. That's going to be yep. some new stuff added. They're, and they're going to base out a wide zone like they have all along. You know, that's that's been kind of their one thing. They're, they're non-negotiable, if you will, <laughs> is is there's going to be wide zone. And, mm-hmm. and and Grimes is from that same family. That's what he wants to run. And, and you know, kind of jumping into another group, you talked about, you know, the, the running backs, wide receivers, us knowing what you have there, tight ends with Deshaun Hanika's injury. You kind of know what the tight ends have there as well. The offensive line, I think, is built to be a pretty good wide zone group, especially with the addition of a guy like Logan Brown. What did what did you see from that unit yesterday? Kind of kind of watching those guys. I thought they were fine. I think KU is doing a lot of mixing, and matching, still trying yeah. to find out what that best five is, but also it's more about two finding out who that sixth and seventh guy is. Because yeah. look, losing Armaje Reed Adams means. Kobe Bain steps up and losing Spencer Lovell means you have to have someone else step up. So really, you know, you're looking at it and K really is replacing four spots along the offensive line. And obviously, you know, Shane Bumgarner is new to the program at center. Daryl Simmons is new to the program as a guard. And then you get someone like Logan Brown back in the mix after his, you know, injury last year. So I think Brown is someone that I think going into the summer, at least, I think probably is the odds on favorite to start a left tackle, especially with, you know, Calvin Clements suffering his injury and he'll be out till July. So he should be back for the start of fall camp. But I think Logan Brown, someone that probably should have the the inside track right now to be left tackle. And I think, you know, this time last year we were talking about, oh boy, like that doesn't, that didn't seem likely. And it turned out that Dominic Pooney was going to be the guy that they moved to left tackle. Um, but I think I feel okay about the offensive line. The depth just isn't the same, I think, as last year where someone like Ramaj could have an injury and you still feel okay because Kobe Baines is a good player. I think it's just a little bit different this year where the guys behind them, someone like you know, Nolan Gorsica, isn't as proven. The tackles, Calvin Clements or James Livingston, not as proven. So it's just kind of a, a little bit of a different situation in terms of the depth going into this year. Yeah, and I think the battle at center is going to be interesting too because, you know, Shane Bumgarner was a guy that that came in, you know, after winning the Remington at the Division II level. And I think a lot of us just went ahead and plugged him into a starting spot. You know, I, I know I've seen from, from your stuff and everything, it sounds like there's a little bit more of a battle there. It, it's not something that he necessarily has wrapped up at this point. And, and that's not a knock on him or, or whatever else, but – We've seen Kansas with Mike Nowitzki the last few years. Center was a, a set it and forget it position. You knew who your starting center was, and it sounds like they they have some decisions to make there as well. Yeah, and on the center spot, it's so funny. I think I need to go back and look at Buffalo and who the center was before Mike Nowitzki. But I think Lance said at one point that it's like they've been they had two centers in eight years or yeah. something like that or two centers in nine years because Nowitzki had the COVID year. Like, it's pretty crazy, you know, yeah. that that has been such a steady position for, for Lance Leipold. And I think this is in line with what KU's done with other transfers, where when they come in the program, they're not put with the ones immediately, right? Yeah. It's what you're with the twos. You're, you learn what the offense is, what the cause is, and then you get put into a competition. So I'm not going to say anyone's won any jobs right now along the offensive sure. line. Outside of Bryce Cable, do it right tackle and probably Kobe Bain's a right guard. Um, outside of that, though, I think the left side can still be jumbled around a little bit. You know, if, if Shane Baumgartner wins his center job, then great, that's perfect. Because then Mike Ford can be the left guard and probably Logan Brown at left tackle, and then you've got the depth of Daryl Simmons and Nolan Corsica, and that feels a lot better. But then if Mike Ford wins the center job, then it's a little bit different because then you're looking at Gorska or Simmons being at left guard. And then you're talking about someone else having to step up and, and be a guard. Cause right now, you know, Bumgarner is working as a center. He is not doing the cross training at guard. 
Um, that's yeah. something that Daryl, like Paul said, talked about when he got to meet with him. So I think overall, right, the offensive line is going to be one of those positions in camp that really is going to come down to the center job and who wins. And based on that, I think that's how the rest of the pieces of the offensive line are going to shake out. Yeah, and I think that offensively, at least, it's so easy. I mean, the two things that you look at with the offense are Jalen Daniels' health, and then the offensive line. I mean, that's everything else you feel pretty good about. And you bring back your top five wide receivers, you know, and, and Keaton Kubeka has, has looked pretty good as, as another guy in that group. Um, and, and so you feel really good about that tight end. Maybe depth is a little bit of a question after, after the injury there. Um, I, I still think, you know, Trevor Cardell is a guy that's played a lot of football and has been around the program a lot. Noah did some really nice things um, at, at the practice. Jared Casey, you know what you have there. And, and so it really feels like offensively, they have a chance to be really good. The two questions are going to be, hey, can you keep can you keep Jalen healthy for, for 12 plus games? And a big part of that is how well are you doing up front? And they do have some interesting answers, I think, there where I, I do think, I thought Logan Brown looked pretty good yesterday. And I think that you know, another thing that, that could be interesting is if you're trying to get your quote unquote best five out there is if Michael Ford wins the center job, do you look and Calvin Clements is looking good? Do you stick Calvin Clements in a tackle spot and move Logan Brown inside because he's a bigger, wider body? You're, he, it, no. For those of you listening uh, no. and not actually watching, Swain is absolutely shaking his head now. No, but Logan I, I Brown has never played guard. I, I just think there are some interesting answers there. I, too, would keep Logan Brown at left tackle. I think he looks really good there. It's an important question to answer is at that spot. I just mean that they could do some, some shuffling around it and find kind of the best combination. They have some intriguing right. guys there. Yeah, well, I don't know if this is out there, but they talked about moving Bryce Cable due to center. La oh. late last season as like a after the season ended while they were trying to figure out what they're going to do with center they yeah. talked to Bryce about it and Bryce was like I've not snapped before we tried left tackle last spring that didn't work out well so I'm just <laughs> let's just stay at right tackle yeah, and then they yeah. were like okay all right that, that makes sense and so they moved on but yeah I think offensive line is fascinating I think yeah. look, wide receiver you know what KU has I think it's more going to be about over the next 12 months can any of those younger guys uh, really step up. Uh, you know, we'll have to see. I think running back, right? You look at um, Devin and Daniel, that's a great one two punch. Can Sevion Morrison stay healthy? If not, is this Harry Stewart or Johnny Thompson, right? I think those are the two guys that have stood out this spring to me, or at least stood out on Friday. I think I Harry Stewart, Stewart looked good yesterday. He's crazy, man. It's crazy to see him in person, right? I think for a lot of people, it's probably their first time. Like, you watch him stay next to Highshaw. And like they look the same physically. Yeah. You watch him stand next to Neil. They look the same physically. And he's 18. It's just crazy how physically developed he is. And he's been this way. If you go back yeah. and look at the official visit photos from last June, like the muscles are popping. Junior, in you watch his junior tape, and yeah. you can see that he looks that way as a high school junior. You know, and so yeah, he looked really good. Johnny Thompson had a really nice carry in mm -hmm. the spring game where. He kind of went up the middle. It was bottled up. He bounced it to the outside and got the outside. That's the element that he adds that, you know, is maybe a little bit different is I think he's got some of that breakaway speed and, and things like that. And, and so, yeah, it's a, after, after Devin and Daniel, and the reason we haven't talked more about them is a lot like Jalen, they got very short spring games. You know, I think they were – they, they were pretty much out there for thud period, which, you know, for those of you who don't know, thud just means you hit, but you don't tackle to the ground. Um, they were out there for thud. They were barely out there, you know, for, you know, full go tackle. And so, you know, Harry Stewart might have gotten 30 carries <laughs> yesterday. I mean, it was it, it was a lot that he, he and Johnny Thompson were getting a, a lot of work for sure. Yeah, they were. And I think it's it's positive, right? You look at the running back room and it's like, man, they've got those two guys who are in their first or second year in the program. And and that's just that, that's really bright because KU's gonna lose Devin after this year, and that's gonna be a huge loss. So having some of those guys that are young that can kind of take this year to learn and continue to develop, that's so huge. Um, let's switch to defense. Uh, we, let's start with the secondary. We can talk about defensive line last. Um, because look, I think the secondary is really good. You didn't yeah. see Kobe and Mello play a lot again. 
that's just a that's a why type of thing for KU. Like why yeah. make Kobe Mello go out and play there that much? Um, Jamil Croft got a lot of playing time. Demarius McGee got playing time. Brian Dilworth at corner. Um, those are kind of the main three getting the reps there. Jacoby Davis. Um, he is in fact small. I think probably yes. some of the people who have not seen him before, he is small. Um, I think he's someone that eventually, you know, playing that slot corner spot could be really good against some of those spread teams yep. like a Texas Tech. I think that's going to be where he eventually finds a role. Safety for me is the most fascinating one because it's so deep and yep. KU is not deep at linebacker. And so what you've seen happen is KU is now the Craig Young spot, right? That we talked a lot about last year. Yep. The part that made Craig Young great is because he could play their Hawk position, which is the linebacker role. He could play the Cinco, which is what most yep. teams have as a hybrid. And then if the time came where they needed to go to a nickel, they'd sub them out. So two out of the three packages on defense, right? Craig Young is on the field. Losing him is big. And so now KU has to figure out, okay, who's going to be the Hawk linebacker? Who's going to be the Cinco? And who's going to yep. be the nickel corner? And right now it seems like basically Jalen Dye and Marvin Grant are going to be on the field a lot because one of them is going to be that Cinco position and Marvin Grant and, and look Jalen too, but Marvin has experience playing linebacker, right? He's played the boundary safety. He's a physical guy. He can move around. Like I think he's the perfect type of player for the Cinco role. And I think getting to see them kind of mix and match a little bit more where Jalen was at Cinco sometimes when Marvin was at boundary safety. I think that's going to be really fascinating to see because it just adds some, you know, we hear the offense talk about multiplicity a lot. Well, it's multiplicity on defense now where you got different guys that can fill different roles and play different spots. And I think that is really important for improving the overall depth of the defense. Yeah, when you look at the production numbers and what Kansas lost at certain positions, Craig Young isn't necessarily the guy that jumps out a lot, but he was so valuable because you could mm -hmm. keep him on the field, like you said. And so having to make those decisions and kind of shuffle guys in and out, find the best roles, I think you're absolutely right, too. If you were asking me what's the best position on this entire football team from not just a starters but also depth, I might pick safety because they are so deep at safety. When you look at the dives, when you look at Mason Ellis looked pretty good yesterday. And, you know, obviously you've got the starters in, in O.J. Burroughs and, and Marvin Grant. And, you know, Marvin Grant looks looks really good. I, I think he's going to have a big season. Uh, when, when you look at that group, it makes sense to try and find ways to get more of those guys on the field, especially, like you said, with, with the depth issues at linebacker. Because at linebacker, you know, there are a lot of things that aren't nearly as settled, especially when you get into the too deep and, you know, not wanting a guy like a J.B. Brown to have to play 80 snaps, 90 snaps in a game. And so, you know, any time you can get those guys off the field for a safety when you've got all that depth and all those guys who can play mm -hmm. at safety it is going to be a good thing. Yeah, exactly. And look, I think linebacker, what was it, the 2021 season? When Rich played all those snaps yep. and you just see at the end of games how tired he was, I think that's the situation that key has got to try and avoid this year. And I think why last year, look, it wasn't perfect at linebacker all the time, but having someone like Jason Gilliam there to spell Craig Young, having the rotating cast of, of guys like JB and Taiwan at, at Will linebacker, right? They were rotating. Cornell spelling Rich Miller at times. Like last year's linebacking core, like, you could talk about the ceiling of talent and stuff like whatever, but they were deep and they had guys that had experience. And now it's kind of a question of who's that second layer that's going to stand out. Cause you know, KU, I think started, what was it? You know, Cornell, JB and Taiwan out there. And yep. I think if KU plays a base three linebacker package, those are the three guys that are going to be out there on the field. And then it's a question of, okay, can Jason Gilliam, who's been banged up during spring, can he play? Um, that Hawk linebacker spot in the base package. Okay. But then you got to find someone that's going to play um, the mic and the will. And so I think there's still probably room for another transfer. I mean, we'll have to, it'll have to see yeah. about the, the scholarship numbers and how that all plays out. But, you know, I think linebacker, you look at the first three, I think you feel okay about it, but it's just kind of that next level and making sure guys can stay fresh throughout the course of the season. I think that for me is going to be probably where my concern lies. And I think some of it's going to depend on someone like Logan Brantley really improving over the course of the summer because I think he's got the talent, but it, it, is it 
is he consistent enough, right? With the mental side of the game, knowing your assignment, being in the right spots all the time, right? That's what being a linebacker is all about. You can have all the athletic potential in the world, but if you're in the wrong spot, that athleticism can't help you at all. So it's, it's linebacker for me is a really fascinating position because I think a lot rides on Logan Brantley improving. And when you have all your hopes pinned on one player, that's a tough spot to be in. Yeah, it's really tough, and I'm glad you brought up Logan Brantley because I was he was a guy that I was really watching a lot, you know, because of the the questions at, at linebacker. And I think, you know, physical development. There's a little more that that could be done there. You know, his you see the guys who have been with Gildersleeve for several seasons now. Their bodies look hmm. for for lack of a a better term electrified, right? Like <laughs> in, in terms of the way that the way that they're muscled up and, and everything, you know, you, you see a big guy at the gym and it's different than seeing somebody who's like ripped, you know, in, in terms of the porting and the different things like that. Brantley doesn't yet have his quote unquote Gilder sleeve body. I, I don't think. Um, and, and, and so I, I think there's some physical development to be done. You know, you, you make a really good point in terms of the diagnosing and, and things like that and, and knowing where you're going to be, because I, I think that's a big Borland thing. I mean, I, it's it's defense everywhere, but I think particularly with Borland, I think his system works when everybody knows exactly where they're supposed to be and what they're supposed to do. It, it's something that, you know, you if you're a Chiefs fan, and I know that you're not, <laughs> but um, if you're a Chiefs fan, you look at, you know, Steve Spagnuolo, he blitzes and he does so many sort of exotic things. That's not really who Brian Borland is, you know, what, what his system is, is he, he wants to make you have to execute for mm -hmm. 15 plays to score a touchdown. And in order to do that, you can't have mistakes. You can't exactly. have things where guys give up a 20 yard play because they're not in the right spot or they're not in the right gap or, or things like that. And so that's going to be something really to watch with, Whoever comes up, if it's Brantley, if it's, you know, Tristan Fletcher, or whoever winds up being kind of that extra linebacker, even if it's a transfer, you know, how quickly can can they learn everything and get to a spot where they're executing their assignment? Because that in Borland's defense is more important than being, quote, big, strong and fast or whatever, knowing what your assignment is and what you're going to do. Exactly. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think, look, um, you know, Brian Borland, I think, is probably one of the better quotes on the coaching staff. I think he is super honest. He tells you like it is. It's not always going to be pretty, right? I think I remember a couple times last year him just saying, yeah, well, we were not good enough, and that, that's not good enough. We will have to improve. And I think one of the things that he said that caught my attention when we talked to him at the beginning of spring was that along the defensive line, he wants to have six guys, yep. right, rotating, right? We can kind of have three deep, five, six guys. You think about last year, you can kind of you can kind of rattle it off, right? Yeah. Or, you know, obviously Jeremy and Austin, but then you had Hayden, um, Patrick Joyner was out there. You know, Dylan Brooks could give you some reps on an occasion. Like they had guys, and then you, I think I don't know about you, Kevin, but watching the defensive ends go through it on Friday night. Obviously, Jeremy's in street clothes. He he'll be back for the season. Dylan Woodkey's out there, and then it's Dean Miller. And look, Dean Miller's gotten some praise this spring for putting on weight, being able to keep it on, right? I think they said he was at something like 205 to 210 for most of his KU career yeah. um, at six foot four, like that's wide receiver type of size, yeah. um, to now being 225, or I think they said 227 the day we talked to him. Like that's huge. And then now he's got to go put on another probably eight to 10 pounds and get there to get to that next level. And then obviously Dylan Brooks is hurt. Um, we'll have to see how long he's out for. It doesn't sound good, but again, it's yeah, we'll have to see. So KU needs defensive end help in the portal. And yeah. I think that for me is what became pretty abundantly clear on Friday night. Well, and especially with the Dylan Brooks injury. I mean, it, and do we know yet if it's a longer term? Uh, I'm mm -hmm. not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> how about that? Yeah, that's that makes sense. That, that definitely makes sense. But it, it's one of those things where we were counting on Dylan Brooks, you know, to to take that step forward. He, he's a talented guy. You know, it, it's one of those things that, you know, you, you kind of 
hoped that he would take that big step forward. You still thought they'd go out and get a portal guy, obviously. Mm -hmm. But but even then, you thought portal guy is a guy that is either going to start or he's going to compete with Dylan Brooks for, for the, a starting spot at, at that weak side end spot. And so for for him to be out it and potentially out for you know an extended period of time that that's that's a big blow and, and it's something where Dean Miller did have some good moments I think like you you hit the nail on the head there there's more that needs to be done from a body standpoint from a weight mm -hmm. standpoint all of those things but uh, at the same time it, it's it's something that I, I'm not sure we know yet who the starter at that position is going to be because I'm not sure they're on campus yet. Yeah, I think that's probably going to be the hope. And look, let me be clear on Dylan Brooks. Like, if he is back for camp and is able to do that, you're still talking about probably several weeks. Like, you, the weight room time that was going to be so key for him. And I think that if you're going to talk about the Austin Booker kind of transformation, right? Austin didn't take the jump before spring football. Sure. He took the jump between spring football and the start of camp. Yep. And right, that's huge. It's those summer months of conditioning in the next couple of weeks conditioning before finals. That's really when a lot of leaps can be made. And so I think even if Dylan Brooks is able to, you know, be back and all that, like you're still talking about key time missed where he yep. could be in there with weight, weightlifting. So I think that's big. I think you are right though, Kevin. I think the hope at least is probably going to be that whoever starts at weak side defensive end for KU is not on campus yet. And they are also fast learners because when they get to campus, it's going to be a crash course to get them ready for the start of the season. And defensive the end thing, will be tough in the portal. The tough thing too, is the fact that everybody's looking for defensive yeah. linemen in the portal. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of one of those things. I, I know you and I had talked about this at the time. A, a coach had told me, yeah, we're going to find our left tackle in the portal. And this was back before the first portal window. And I was like, yeah, you and everybody else, buddy. Mm -hmm. like, you know, there there are certain positions that it's really tough to find somebody there. And, and in some cases, you almost have to get a little bit creative in terms of guys that, that you're, you're able to find, whether that's going down to the Division II level, whether that's finding somebody, you know, who, who leaves a max school late because – if you remember right, KU was one of the first people to offer, uh, one of the first teams to offer uh, Jared Verse at mm. Florida, who wound up at Florida State yeah. and is now going to be a first round draft pick. They went after you know the the number one A defensive end in that transfer portal yeah. cycle, and his offers exploded, and, and you know KU never got a visit or wasn't really you know involved in his process. Mm -hmm. And so when you, it's really easy to see when the portal blows up to be like, oh, this defensive end from Ohio State just became available. And it's like, there's a pecking order here. You know, there, there are a lot of people that, that are going to want that kid. And, and so Kansas faces a lot of competition, you know, to get a ready to play right now in the Big 12 defensive end. And so uh, I'm interested to see how they, how they handle that in this portal window. And this, this portal window could wind up being pretty wild overall, I think. It could be. It could be. Um, and then, look, I think defensive tackle, I actually feel kind of good about the group. Look, you got basically yeah. five, six guys that have played a lot of football before, and that's all you can ask for at defensive tackle. Like, is it the same type of, like, like a game-changing type of guy that Gage Keys could have been? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Again, it's still – we're still talking about spring football, and for – a transfer like Javier Darrett, like you're not going to know until midway through camp really, because that point he's comfortable. He's not learning. Yeah. He's not getting used to the practice speed that KU has. So look, I think that's probably the, the you know, that's the area of the defensive line. I feel okay about what do you D think? DJ Withers and Tommy Dunn look great. Like physically they look great. You know, everything else. Keenan Caldwell. I, I know we've talked about him before, I give that kid so much credit because mm -hmm. he came in, you know, to play a, a two gap system. He's a more natural, you know, sort of nose tackle in, in, you know, in a two gap system where your head's up over somebody and you're trying to control space. That's not really what Kansas does now. It would have been very easy for that kid to just say, Hey, I'm not really a, a great fit for, for what they're doing, but He's stuck it out, and he has a chance to be in that too deep and, and whatever else. And so 
a, a kid that stuck around, kept working, didn't go in the portal. You know, you, I think you have to give him a lot of credit. Yeah, the program guys. And I think this yeah. is the big offseason for the program guys, period. I mentioned Nolan Gorska. He yeah. fits that mold, in my opinion. Sure. Caleb Taylor and, and Keenan Caldwell are two guys like that. Cornell Wheeler's been in the program for a long time. I think yep. this is the offseason where you see a lot of the guys that, that you know, Lance Leipold has either gotten or were really young when he took over. Those, those are the guys that now have to start stepping up, and then that allows that kind of pipeline to continue. Um, let's hit on some special teams. I owe uh, Tackle 3 on the VIP board. He wants me to talk about special teams. All uh, right. All right. So, uh, Kevin, what would you see? I, do, I couldn't tell how far the punts were going. That yeah. really pissed me off. I couldn't tell. Like, I'm sitting there trying to, like, calculate, okay, well, if this is the, the 30, like, where are they at? So I, I got no idea how far. Yeah, the the yard bar, the yards. If you weren't there, they weren't super clearly defined. <laughs> I mean, they, they. It was it was, it was kind of like a high school like freshman game where you had like the little things that said like 40, 50, you know, or whatever. But like they weren't marked on the actual field mm-hmm. itself, and, and so that made it difficult when somebody would complete a long pass and you're trying to be like, okay, was that, you know, fifty. You're, you're trying to count it out, and it wasn't the easiest thing in the world. I did think, you know, the field goal kickers did really, really well. Mm-hmm. All of them. They, they, they all made their, they all made their kicks, and you know, I think at one point they had three different guys rotate through in a row, and mm-hmm. all three made their kicks, and, and and so it was, you know, that part was really good. There was no return game, you know, for those who, yeah. who weren't there. You know, they would. They would basically have the punter just kick the ball up in the air and then somebody would catch it and then they would go into offense or, or defense. And so you didn't get a chance to see, you know, hey, how's the return game looking or, or anything like that. I do think overall, even without us seeing it, I think as Kansas's roster depth continues to improve, special teams is where you're going to see a lot of that growth because of the fact that the guys who are out on special teams are better football players than, than there were before. Before you either risked, one, either you didn't have the roster depth so the guys who were out there weren't very good, or two, because of your lack of roster depth, you were putting starters out there who were playing a bunch of time and then also playing special teams. And and that's not going to be as much of an issue for, for KU as well. But that was, that was kind of what I thought. I, I did think there were a couple – punts that looked nice without, you know, having the actual yardage in front of me where I could say, Oh, that was a 50 yard punt or whatever. Uh, what, what did you think? Yeah. Punting. I got no idea. I think you just got to hope that Damon <laughs> Greaves can look. I think it's an interesting situation with KU where they basically decided last year that, okay, Damon, you're going to kick the ball really high and then try and get it as far as you can. Right. KU did not allow a single punt return yard last year. Yep. Right. That's, I think that's a conscious decision that is made to do that. I think they finished with minus one net, didn't they? That could be it. I, I yeah, 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 no, I mean, they, they, I know they didn't allow a single punt return yard, and I think Graves was at zero, and I think maybe one of their quick kicks got like a minus one or, or something like that. So I oh, think maybe. they, I think they wound up with a minus one net. So yeah, technically teams, teams lost yardage when KU punted to him. Yeah. And, and it's important you say that, and I'm sorry to cut you off, because you look at Damon Graves punting and averaging 39 yards, and you're like, oh, that's that's brutal. That's that's awful. And then you look at the fact that it was a 39-yard net, you know, and that's different. You know, that's, yeah. that, that's not bad. And so, yeah, I think that's a really good point for you to make. Yeah, so, and then uh, field goal kicking, I think that's going to be a competition, right? Owen Pieper Gertis, Charlie Weinrich, um, those are the main two. I don't think Tabor Allen will end up doing field goals. I think it's going to yeah. come down to those two. Uh, Charlie did work with the ones, from what I remember. Yeah, he, he was, was one a heck of a one. high school kicker. He really was. Yeah, he was. He was. And then you've got um, Peeper Gertis, right? He's got a really great leg. Um, yeah. So yeah, he's huge. I mean, he's huge. He looks like a tight end. He looks like he, a tight he end. He is. You, you see, you see him walking around, and you think he's a tight end or defensive end. That's no, that's that's a kicker. Kicker, yeah. So that's where things stand special teams wise. I mean, look, kick return, punt return. You, you figure that out in, in preseason camp, right? Yep. Who's going to be the guy? Trevor Wilson was back there. 
doing a lot of the punt return stuff. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's all the positions, Kevin. I mean, you got any other final thoughts? I'm trying to think of other things we can well, talk about. One, one guy we didn't mention that I thought was really interesting to watch was Dak Brinkley because mm. of what we were talking about at the defensive end and spot and everything. And with him enrolling early, there's a lot of freshmen there <laughs> in terms of, you know, he he's raw and, and he needs to continue to fill out his body and everything else. But the one thing that I'll say is as somebody who used to cover Texas and, and you would get, you know, when the freshmen showed up, they would be five-star guys or, you know, four-star guys, and they looked a certain way or whatever. Mm -hmm. Dak Brinkley looks like that, you know, kind of that, that long, you know, kind of lanky pass rusher who has that, that quickness to him. He, he looks like a pass rusher that, Hey, on reporting day at Oklahoma or Texas, if Dak Brinkley showed up, he wouldn't look out of place. And, And that's, that's the type of guy that, that Kansas doesn't typically get in, in their classes. And, and when you look at Isaiah Stewart, you look at, you know, uh, sorry, not Isaiah Stewart. Uh, That'd be one heck of a player. I, yeah, I, uh, Isaiah Marshall. Uh, when you look at Isaiah Marshall, when you look at Harry Stewart, which is why I, I mixed him up, you you look at Dak Brinkley. Uh, uh, I was watching Damani Maxson, you know, walk around it and stuff like that. This class, I think, is going to be potentially, you don't want to say a foundational class because Kansas has technically already built the foundation. Mm. But I think this class being the highest rated class, you know, in the recruiting database era, I do think that that's going to show up on the football field where you're going to look out and say, this guy looks a little bit different than what Kansas has had in the past. And there are multiple guys like that in that class. Yeah, I think a lot of the guys, yeah, they all, the early enrollees, right? Six of them, yeah. um, you know, most of them passed the eye test, I'd say. And yeah. I think that's just all you can ask for. And I'm excited for a preseason camp yeah. to get to see some of those other guys, right? You know, it was funny to watch. You put this in perspective, Kevin. So Harrison Utley, um, Austin Alexander, and David Abagian were all there as signings. Yeah. It is so weird to think that the same guys that they signed with, right? And what is that, five months ago? four months ago um, yep. or on the field playing. It's just so yep. like the whole early and really thing, it's going to become more popular. More guys are going to do it, but just to see like those guys sitting in the stands, watching some of the guys that they signed with play. I think that's just, it just puts it in perspective, right? You know how when you early enroll it is such a huge bonus and it's why so many guys are going to continue to do it. The numbers are only going to grow because yeah. it's a, you just get the extra weight room time, you get to learn, you get to go through a spring showcase like that so that when fall camp comes around, you know what practice is like. And it kind of yeah. you can probably make this the full uh, full circle moment. But K practices really fast, and it's really, really hard for freshmen when things are already moving fast on the field. When all of a sudden the drills you're doing, it's bam, bam. You're moving all over the place. You got to know what drill comes next. Like, oof, it, it is hard. So those early enrollees get that time, and then when fall camp comes, they're ready to hit the ground running. Yeah, yeah. And if you want to play early, and pretty much every recruit that you ever talk to says that that they want to play early, you know, that that's such a big help. And, and getting in early, getting that weight room time, especially with a strength coach like Gildersleeve, you know, who I, I think is is highly effective and, and really good at his job. You look at, at the transformation, you brought this up earlier. Austin Booker became Austin Booker over that extra time in the off season and, and everything. And, you know, one of the things that they've talked about was that Austin Booker was not a great lateral athlete when he came in. And that was something that they were able to diagnose and, and work on quickly. And he winds up becoming a, an all big 12 guy. And, and so those guys coming in, you know, you can see with a guy like, like Dak Brinkley, you can say, okay, he needs to fill out here. He needs to get, stronger in his lower body or, or certain things like that. Gildersleeve is really good at tailoring specific programs to specific players. You know, it's not a one size fits all type of thing. And so for these freshmen to enroll early, to learn the system, to learn, like you said, the practice habits, the culture, all of those things is huge, but it's also really big to get into Gildersleeve's lab and have him working on you that extra bit of time. Exactly. Exactly. You're totally right. So that's what we got 
for this one. Um, any other final thoughts on the spring showcase, Kevin? I think that's what I've got. Obviously, a lot of well, I'll, I'll plug this. I got a lot of VIP stuff coming. Um, we'll do projected depth charts. Um, we'll do winners from spring camp. We'll do. I mean, I've got I've got probably about a week and a half to two weeks full of like spring content wrap stuff that we'll be running through. So we got a spring sale coming on Monday. I want to say, yeah, Monday, 60% off. So if you're not signed up for VIP, probably a good time to do it. Sign up. Yeah, it'd, it'd be a great time to do it, especially since you've got spring. You had a big official visitor this week, right? Yeah, yep, exactly. And big so official you're, you're going to get updates on that. And, you know, Portal. I, I know this is a – I know this is a football show, but at the same time, you know, those, those of you who love basketball out there, you know, transfer portal stuff and, and all that, this is, this is a really good time to subscribe. So it's crazy. Yeah. But <laughs> you, you, will have new, portal, you will have no shortage of work over the next few weeks. So. Uh huh. I can't wait. It should be fun. Should be fun. Well, Kevin, thanks as always for jumping on. I'm sure we'll do another one of these when summer comes around and start getting some summer content out for our great podcast audience as always make sure you are liking these videos on the YouTube channel, subscribing to the YouTube channel. A lot of people who watch the videos aren't subscribing. So we need you to subscribe so we can one day catch Kobe Bryant. Um, if you're <laughs> liking what you're hearing on the Apple podcasts, I think that's what they're called these days or Spotify, make sure you leave ratings and reviews. Those go a long way in helping us find new Kansas fans. Um, and maybe you want to listen to the show or not, who knows? Well, that's what I got. Um, for Kevin Flaherty, I'm Michael Swain. Thank you so much for listening to the Fog.net podcast. We'll talk to you all next time.